How's it going? What you reading? What's going on? Hello? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just pissed off, you know, I mean, just, the world is just full of, I mean, WMDs, EMPs, CMEs, MREs, VDs, don't even get me started on SJWs, you know? SJWs. <laughs> he doesn't like social justice. You know, I just, I just feel like the world would be better if we just blew the whole thing up and started from scratch. I presume you would not be blown up in this. Yeah, right. Of course. Mm. Well, I mean, uh, that's one way to look at it. Uh, I prefer... You know, F this. I need to go do a BM. Mm. TMI. everybody, this is Praxis, and in this video I have a special guest for you. It's Arthur Bradley. He is uh, an engineer that has worked extensively for NASA. He has his PhD in electrical engineering, and while that's very interesting to me, and I'm sure lots of you, why is he on a prepping channel? And the reason is because he is a really well-respected by me and many other people, authority, on the topic of electromagnetic pulses. And uh, you know, you may be familiar with electromagnetic pulse, uh, you may not be familiar. Don't worry, if you have no idea what I just said, He's going to fill us in, but first off, I want to thank Arthur for being here with me. Thank you very much for agreeing to sit down with me today. Sure, happy to be here. So, uh, I was directed to you as being an expert on this by many people, and I'll be honest, I when I connected your name with who you were, I was really excited to talk with you because I have been a fan of your work on YouTube for a while. I've been over at your, your website. I remember I had done some research for a series that I had, uh, you know, a kind of a mock uh, alien invasion scenario which teaches pre prepping lessons and things of that nature. There was a Faraday cage that came into that and you were the guy that I really used as my um, uh, sort of mentor without you knowing it <laughs> to get me up to speed on that. I, I hope that wasn't a mistake. I don't think that was a mistake. No, I'm glad I helped save you from the aliens. <laughs> yes, yeah. So uh, I, I've been a fan of yours for a while. I think you do really great work. You're thorough. Um, I come from a family of engineers. Engineers are my people. I love, it's like, it's no BS. It's like it either works or it doesn't. And uh, yeah, I, it's a real pleasure to talk with you today. So let's jump right in and share with people, what is an EMP? All right, so well, when most people talk about an EMP, they're really talking about a very specific type of EMP. They're talking about a high altitude nuclear detonation that causes an electromagnetic pulse at the surface of the Earth. So really an EMP is just an electromagnetic pulse, some broadband release of energy. But when people are talking about an EMP, they're almost always talking about one generated by a nuclear bomb exploding in the atmosphere. Are there natural EMPs that can occur? Yeah, really an EMP can be anything that releases some broadband pulse of energy. So the sun releases energy, a lightning strike, a nearby lightning strike releases energy that could be considered an EMP. You can generate your own uh, if you have some kind of like a spark gap where you, you open up a high current um, connection really quickly, you'll generate an EMP from that. But it's really the scale of this nuclear generated EMP that makes it such a threat. Why do people care at all about EMP? I mean, what, does it have any impact on anything or is it just sort of a scientific phenomenon? It's like, oh, there was an EMP. What does it mean to us if an EMP goes off in our proximity? Right, yeah, and that question is debated by many. Uh, there are sort of two different camps. There's the camp that, that run around saying, oh, this is all just, you know, hocus pocus stuff, that there really isn't anything here. And then there are other sort of a more scientific community that say, well, you know, EMP has been studied since at least the 60s when they did detonations over the ocean, they measured these electromagnetic pulses. And they found that they were so powerful, in fact, that many hundreds of miles away, they could cause damage to electrical equipment through the radiated energy. And so people started thinking, well, maybe that's useful as a weapon. And in fact, the Russians, the Chinese, the North Koreans, even, uh, even Iran has threatened that there might be ways to use an EMP against the United States to cause damage to its infrastructure primarily. And so the big concern is that if somebody detonated, a, let's say North Korea, detonated a nuclear weapon high over the continental United States, that they could take out our electrical grid. That would be the biggest threat. But they could also damage a lot of freestanding electronics that weren't plugged into the grid as well. So there's a, there's a potential for a really widespread uh, trillions of dollars worth of damage from something like that happening. You suggested that uh, 
independent of whether something might be plugged into the electrical grid, it could still suffer from an electromagnetic pulse. Are all types of technology that we may have in our home equally vulnerable to it? Or are there, there are some types that are more uh, susceptible? Is it based on size? Or like, how, how can you figure out whether any given piece of technology you have may or may not be susceptible to an EMP pulse? Right, so they're, they're not all the same. Uh, different electronics have different susceptibility. And I like to use like an example of like a heavy duty motor is not very susceptible to an EMP. It's used to taking large currents through it and it's very unlikely that you would damage it with any kind of radiated wave. Um, on the other hand, something very sensitive, let's say like a radio receiver, that's meant to take in very, very small signals and amplify them, are obviously very susceptible to radiated energy. And so radios certainly would be very susceptible. Even cell phones and other uh, solid state electronics, or modern electronics, you can think about it, things with chips in them, they have some susceptibility. Now, the smaller the device is, the smaller the electrical traces are in that device, the less energy gets coupled in. The longer the traces are, the easier it is to couple energy into them. So there's sort of two things working against each other. One is you have these modern technologies mixed all together and that makes them susceptible. But on the other, other hand, things tend to be kind of small, right? Cell phones are pretty tiny and that makes them a little less susceptible. So it's a really, it's a mixed bag of what would be damaged and what wouldn't be in terms of our modern electronics. One area people worry most about is our vehicles. You know, there's a lot of, uh, there's been a couple of movies and some books written about an EMP that detonate over the U.S. and then destroy everybody's vehicles, which of course would cause a lot of problems. Um, in reality, it probably wouldn't happen that way. There would be some that were damaged because there is a lot of controllers and processors and computers uh, all inside of cars, but the likelihood is that many would still survive. So again, it's sort of a mixed bag of what would be damaged and what wouldn't be. We've talked a little bit about the fact that most people are fixated on the, uh, well, fixated might be kind of the wrong word to use. <laughs> most people are looking at the idea of a, a human cause, like a, a nuclear precipitated electromagnetic pulse. But there have been some natural, uh, you know, electromagnetic pulses, even something, I, I, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, but like a bolt of lightning can create an electromagnetic pulse. Are there, first off, am I wrong or am I right about that? No, no, you're right about that. Yeah, again, if a lightning strikes nearby, it releases a powerful electromagnetic wave, which could be considered an EMP. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, so clearly every time a, light, a lightning bolt strikes, you know, it's not grid down and like it's anarchy in the United States. There was a lightning bolt. What, so what are the kind of differences between human caused and natural EMPs? Obviously not all natural EMPs or not all human caused EMPs are going to be exactly the same, but could they be divided up into kind of Di different rough categories in terms of their effects on us? Uh, yeah, I think so. So a nuclear EMP is really its own entity and there's a couple different kinds. One is a low altitude burst, which is really meant to target like a specific facility, let's say a military facility. And so you might detonate something, oh, I don't know, a few thousand feet in the air, right? And you would certainly would cause a tremendous EMP down at the surface, but it would be localized. Maybe, you know, think handfuls of city blocks kind of thing, right? Whereas if you can detonate it high enough in the atmosphere, and now you're thinking miles up in the atmosphere, let's say above 100,000 uh, feet or so, and likely much higher than that, maybe even a couple hundred miles. If you can detonate it that high, the area of effect becomes much, much larger because the field of view is so much bigger, right? And so you can actually take essentially the entire continental U.S. Uh, in that field of view with a single warhead over the continental U.S. in the middle of it. And what happens is there's a weird amplification effect, um, and it's due to something called Compton scattering, but it's not so important we go into that. But you can imagine when you detonate a nuclear bomb, you release these gamma rays, these high energy rays, and they ultimately ionize air molecules. And there's sort of an avalanche effect that occurs through part of the atmosphere, and that causes a strong, strong perturbation of our magnetic field lines. And ultimately that results in a very powerful disturbance at the surface of the Earth. So it's a unique effect. The one that you have these high altitude bursts is a very unique thing. So clearly this is something that has both natural and man-made uh, potential causes for it. And it legitimizes, I think, a lot of the concern of people in the prepping community is having something, this be something that's on their radar. Uh, in the next video that I'm going to be talking with Arthur about, I want to talk to him about the idea of, you know, is this just all in theory? Is this, you know, just scientists and they've kind of, you know, crunch the numbers and they kind of figure out this is something that could happen? Or is there a real track record of seeing these things actually happen in the real world, you know, where the rubber meets the road and we find out what's theory and what's uh, reality? So in the next episode, when Arthur has been so nice to uh, come back and chat with me again, we're going to be talking about that and find out what really happens when these things go off. Thank you very much for being with me, Arthur, and thank you guys for watching.
Please subscribe and tune in every Friday at 4.30 New York time for a new video. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so both through Patreon or PayPal.